Now that we have Dartfrog installed and created our first application, before we dive into coding our application, let's have a quick session and learn Dart on its own as a language. This is beginner friendly, so if it is your first time interacting with Dart, but you have an understanding of programming's basics, I believe you'll feel at home. Let's use Dartpad, which is an online Dart editor. Uh, you can find it in dartpad.dev. I'll share the link in the description box below. Every app requires a top level main function, which is where the execution starts. We'll clear existing code inside it and print hello world. Let's click on run. And there we have our string printed out. Now let's look at variables. Look at a variable as a container that stores a type of information depending on how you define it. It could be an integer or number, a text or other complex data structures or data types. If we have a variable that's given a number three to store, what it does is it stores a reference to an object of type integer with a value of three. Or if we have a variable that's given the text dat, what it does, it stores a reference to an object of type string with a value of dat. Let's define a few variables in our dat pad. So we'll start with basic data types. Uh, to define a variable, you need to set a data type and then define a variable name. So let's uh, show an example. So first, if you want to have a variable that's of type integer, you define the data type and then give it a variable name. Preferably, it should be a descriptive noun and also use the camel case notation and preferably nouns. And then you initialize your variable as so. So let's define another variable of type string. So we'll give it the type string, then give it the name username is equals to Bob. So basically that's how you do it. Then another the basic data type will be bool, uh, correct, um, is equals to true or false. Great. And so um, you have to make sure when you're creating a variable name, you need to avoid reserved words like the word class that's already reserved in a da in a programming language. So another um, data type that we can uh, define will be double. If you want to get the balance of an account, is equals to two hundred point forty maybe, for example. Great. So another thing to look at are type test operators. These are just operators that assert that a value is a correct type. For example, let's print and say username is string. If we try and print this out, oh yeah, sorry, int user age. I can't believe I did say this all this time. 10, wow. I'm sure most of you who are looking at that, waiting for me to discover that I'm wrong. Sorry about that. So username is string, true. So that's how you check it. But if you say is int and run it, it should be false because username is not an integer. Great. Another basic thing that we can look at is in situation where you need to use the data type uh, final. Final... Um, arsenal fun is equals to true this is where now you don't want to specify the first you don't want to specify the you're not certain it can be used when you're not certain of the data type of a variable but mainly it's used to actually finalize the value that you want to initialize to a specific variable great so those are the that's the basic part of variables. Uh, you'll get to inter we'll get to interact with them a lot. And variables play a basis of classes and objects. So there's so much we'll do with them. But basically having an understanding of the basic data types, how a variable is declared. Declaring means you just uh, name it as so. 
and then you decide to initialize it as so. So with that, let's proceed to the next one. So variables cannot be null by default. If you want to allow null, you can add the null safety operator before the data type like this. Let's say we want to uh, declare a variable of number of views and give it a data type of double. So for us to be able to create a variable that um, allows null, we'll set it as first, enter the data type, and then we're going to give it the null safety operator that looks like that and define our variable name, number of views, like so. You can also set a variable as a late variable. What late variables are, they are variables that hold the late modifier and refer to a non-nullable variable that's declared and initialized later within the code. Meaning, I have, in, I have declared this variable, but I'm not initializing it at the moment when I'm, when I'm declaring it. So I just want to add the late modifier telling the compiler that I'm not going to use it until I initialize it somewhere within the code. Let me give an example. So we have a, let's define a variable here for a new recipe, for example. So we'll give the recipe, we define the recipe name. So we'll give it a type of string, new recipe, right? But now I want to add here late because I'm not going to initialize it at this point. As you can see, before we entered the late modifier, there was an error here because we expected to initialize it. Variables cannot be null by default. So now that we've added late, what we need to do, we have to make sure that within the code, before we use this new recipe, we have to have initialized it somewhere. So what we're going to do, we're going to come here now and, if, and initialize our variable. Our new recipe is equals to Hawaiian pizza. And then we can print our description, our new recipe, sorry. So let me just comment this guys so that we don't have these warnings on the right side. So let's try and print our new recipe. If we run this, we'll get, uh, we'll be able to print our variable. But let's take a scenario where we have declared the variable, but we want to print it out and we haven't even initialized it. So if we decide to run this code, we'll get an error of late initialization error because variables cannot be null by default. Great. If you want to assign a nullable value, in our case, an example of a nullable value is number of views variable. To a non-nullable variable, you use the postfix non-null assertion operator. So let's create a new variable that's a nullable value and name it new score. And then create another non-nullable val variable and give it double total is equals to 100. Great. So for if we want to actually assign or assign a nullable value like new score and, or maybe like some add new score plus total, we need to use a postfix and null assertion operator. You can't just add them together as they are. So let's create a simple function that says get total and we need to pass the total and if the new score is there, so if we, we want to return total plus new score. But we'll get an error because it knows that the new score is a nullable value variable. That means it's probable that it can return, it can pass, it can be equivalent to a null value. So for us to handle that, we pass in the postfix null assertion operator like so. So the error has gone. So let's try and print the value that we get from this function. So we'll pass our total 
and then we pass the new score right now our new score has not been initialized so let's try and assign it first first let's pass it as is, as it is so that you get to see the error that we'll get so if we run this we'll get an error but if now we decide to assign the new score and not leave it as a nullable value and give it 10 and decide to print again we'll get our value that is 100 plus 10 which is 110 great so to learn more about null safety i have left an article that i wrote on medium the link is in the description box below control flow is a fundamental concept in programming that refers to the order in which statements or instructions are executed so con control flow allows programmers to determine how their code will behave in different scenarios based on certain conditions in many programming languages, control flow is managed through the use of conditional statements such as if and else and loops as well, which allow a section of code to be executed repeatedly until a certain condition is met. So let's see how this is done in that. So for conditional statements, um, we can use the if else statement. So what we can do is we can say Let's define a variable of type bool and give it the name completed is equals to false. And then we can decide to create conditional statements with if else by saying if completed. What this means is if it's set to true, print you are done with your project else that means if it's false print you need to complete this project so if we decide to print so yeah, if we decide to run this, the reason why we're getting this um, error over here is because by default, since we've already set completed to false, it will obviously fall on the else statement. So what we can do is let's just create a function and say get status bool completed. So we say we pick this cut and paste it here and instead of print we can say return return project then we pick our function here and just call it we'll just say print we call our function and pass true so we may not need this variable just to see how it works so if we run this we expect it to say you're done with your project but if we set it to false and run this you need to complete this project so that's the basic of if else statement so for, let's do a simple for loop and let's take a scenario where we are doing a for loop so for int count is equals to one and count is less than or equal to 10 and then we increment the count print count so if you're familiar with the uh, object oriented this is quite similar so let's print that we can comment this and just run it so it will print from 1 to 10 great so that's the basic for loop so let's say we have int count is equals to 0 and then we want to use the while count is less than or equal to 10 
while count is less than or equal to 10 print count past the incrementer and let's print this and see so we can comment this one so that we see how the while works and if we run this it will print from 0 to 10 it's including the 10 because we said count is less than or equal to 10 so basically those are the, the simple the simple way of handling control flow in that it's quite similar because remember that is an object oriented programming language so it's quite common or relatable if you have interacted with OOP now let's look at operators so there are different types of operators we can start with arith arithmetic operators these are just symbols used to perform mathematical operations like addition subtraction multiplication division so let's try a few so let's have an a variable of type integer called um number one um or let's give it a first number is equals to three and then we give and we define another variable second number is equals to two so to be able to do an addition so what you simply do is call the first number and use the addition symbol and add with the second number so if we print this we'll get five correct next is subtraction subtraction is the same thing first number minus second number and if we do that that means it will take three minus two so we'll get one great then we have multiplication so it will be first number times second number sorry so that means we're passing three times two so we're expecting six correct then let's do a division so it will be first number divide by second number so it will be 3 divided by 2 and we'll get 1.5 great then if we want to return in the point of division if we want to return the integer which is 1 instead of 1.5 we'll just pass the first number then we'll use this symbol as so and then we just pass the second number this should return to us the one instead of 1.5 great next if you want to get the modulus or now the number five instead of passing getting 1.5 all you have to do or it's what we call the remainder it's just a first number and then we Use a symbol and pass the second number. And if we do that, we expect to get 1 because 3 divided by 2. Uh, so it will be first divided by. So it will be you pass 1, 2, and what will remain with is 3 minus 2, which is 1. This is correct, right? But if you convert it into a decimal, it will be 0 0.5. I hope that makes sense <laughs> so the next thing is if you want to increment a value there are two ways so if we want to increment first number we can increment it by passing the increment symbol as so or pass it as so so let me just print out this one so that we get to see how they these two results will look like so if we run this we'll get 3 and 5 
so this is the first number which is three if so what that when you have the when you have the postfix increment the original value of a is returned first you see so if we do it again so the original value is the one that comes first and then it adds to it but because we have always initialized it it will always pick three but if you want first to add the one to that initial value and then print out that's when you use the prefix increment so in this case the first number is what the reason why it's printing three it's because it's reprinting out the original value but once this print has been done it has already added plus one three plus one so our first number now is four so with the, the next print which is the the next print which is a prefix increment it increments by one then prints out after already it's what it's picking as the first number it's not the three but this four and then adds plus one so it's equals to five and that's what it prints so the first one which we call the this one is the one that we call the postfix increment and this is the one that we call the prefix increment so this one it increments fast and returns the prints out the new value but this one it prints out the original value fast then increments and that's the same thing we do with um, the minus there's a postfix decrement and a prefix decrement so another thing we can look at is equality or comparison operators so this is where like, if we continue using our two variables we can print um, and check if first number is equals to second number so we are comparing let's print that and see oh sorry first let's run that and see false so they're not the same another um, comparison operator will be if first number is not equal to second number so we expect a true great another one will be if first number is greater than second number so we expect it to be true great and then if print first number is less than second number so we expect it to be false so with comparison operators you find what's being returned is the bool boolean true or false another one will be print if first number is less than or equal to second number is greater than or equal to so it's greater than so it will pass a true so if it's greater than or equal a true or false is equals to a true true or false is equals to a true so next will be the last one will be print first number sorry first number is less than or equal to second number so is first number less false is it equal to false so we're expecting a false let's try and run that great so we're good so another type of operator that we can look at is um, the assignment operator they're used to assign values to variables i think uh, we have interacted with some of them so with our two variables here an example is the equal sign it's one of the assignment variables where we are assigning a variable to a such specific value another one will be we can decide to print first number plus is equals to four so what we are doing here we are taking we want the, to print um, sorry it's not supposed to be printed we're supposed to say first number is equals to first number plus is equals to four 
So if we decide to print first number, we expect our first number is 3. So plus 4 is equal to 7. So if we try and run this, wait, or oh, because of the, oh yeah, you remember this? It's actually affecting the value of this to our variable. So let's print that out and try again. So we'll get 7. So what, this is a shorter way of writing this. So you can use a plus is equals to do that. Is also minus is equals. There is times is equals. There is division. It's the same values that we have been using here at the top in the arithmetic we're showing arithmetic operators and then you add the equal sign that's that's the assignment operators and then we can look at like the last one will be like logical operators where you combine uh, expressions so we can say something like um, print first number is greater than or equal to 4 or sorry uh, or first second number is equal to two so we're combining we're combining expressions so here what we're saying is what we need to check first number is greater than or equal to four is it greater than or equal to four three is not greater than four neither is it equal to four so this will be false and then this means or or second number is equal to is equals to true two yes so that's true so in such a situation where it's false or true the result will be true let's try and print that out and see correct so with that um we have been able to go through some of the basic operators that you can interact with with that so next up let's proceed to look at the next um feature if we look at functions we have actually created a function one or two functions uh, as we were explaining some of the concepts in that so basically what uh, a function is it's a block of code that performs a specific task or set of tasks as we have we had created before when we were initializing the total variable and the new score variable so we can just do it again just to see so we had created a very simple where we just specified the function name but you can also specify the data type of that function so in our case we can define a function name of sum and then give it a data type of double that means we're returning a double data type and then we pass in our parameters so we'll have double new score and then we'll have a uh, double old total so let's create add the braces then inside here what we'll do we'll just do a return new score plus old total so we have we have a return type and it will return a type of double and we have our parameters so let's try and print out what we'll get here print sum let's set 2.0 plus 10.0 sorry so we expect 12.0 right sorry plus where would i put plus so we have two arguments we are passing the new score which will be 2.0 and the old total which will be 10.0 so we expect 12.0 so this is how to create a function simply of course we'll be able when you're creating functions when you're creating our project they'll they're usually quite big but again you're not supposed to create a big big blocks of code it's good to actually break them down and we'll get to see that so let's have a quick look on uh, lists um, let me clear this 
So that can be can also represent a collection of objects. We have been looking at these data types that hold like a specific object, either in form of integer, string, boolean. But now that also can represent a collection of objects using one of them being lists. A list in that is an ordered collection of elements where each element has a numerical index. And it's similar to arrays in other programming languages that you may have interacted with. So let's create a list of fruits. We'll define the data type of list. And then we're going to give it a generic type. Generics are often required for type safety, meaning what I'm trying to say is that the we are defining a collection of objects, but these objects will all be of type string, for example. So you're specifying to for type safety purposes. So we'll call our variable name fruits and just initialize it like so. So we have that. Next, we're going now to we just defined it now let's give it some values so fruits is equals to apple sorry apples bananas pears just like that and now you have your list of objects and by any chance you enter a different type of data type you'll get an error because what this collection of object is expecting is only strings so that's a simple way of creating lists in that let's look at another collection of objects called maps um, so a map in that is an unordered collection Remember, lists are ordered collections. So you, when you want to get a value, I think that's something I missed out on. If I want to get the value apples, all I have to do is say fruits. And apples is assigned to a specific numeric of index, which is zero. Uh, every The first value will always start with zero. So if we call it, if you want to pick it, we pass in the index zero. And if we try and print this out, will get apples so it's in a form of order so by for maps it's an unordered collection of key value pairs where each key is unique and associated with a specific value so it's similar to json object or dictionary in other programming languages that you may have interacted with so let's create a simple map so we'll define map and also uses the generic type so you can specify that this map of ours will have the key will be in form of a string and our value will be in form of an integer and let's give it the variable name ages so let's insert some values here so we'll have string alice 25 the key bob which will have the value 30 and then we'll have another key charlie that will have the value 28 so that's a map so let's try and get uh, the output for we want to get the age of bob to do that all we have to do is call the variable and then we pass the key bob Let's print this out and see. And there we have it, 30 as we should expect. As you may recall, we mentioned that that is an object-oriented programming language. So there's an important concept that we need to look at and they are called classes. So a class is a blueprint for it's a blueprint for an object that holds a set of attributes or those attributes are basically variables and functions that define the characteristics of a specific object so let's try and design a class so we'll come here and call let's define a class called recipe and inside this class we'll have two variables Let's define a variable of type integer and call it number of ingredients. 
and let's define another variable called of data type string and call it must ingredient and assign it the value garlic great so another thing that we want to add is called a constructor it's a special function or method in a class that is automatically called whenever an object of this class is created and we'll get to create it and it's used for initializing the object's attributes or performing any setup tasks okay so the this keyword so let's define uh, this special function uh, holds the name the, fun the name of this special function holds the name of the class so our function or the constructor will hold the name recipe and then we're going to pass in the number of ingredients so we, for us to get this we need to use it this keyword this dot number of ingredients so we said that our class is a set of functions and variables so we have our variables but what we want to pass create also is a function just one function so we'll call our function cook and all we're going to do is just print and say cooking with just passing the number of ingredients cooking with this ingredients so it will just print out this message depending on what's passed when we're creating the when we're calling this object that's why we are passing this number of ingredients because we expect it whenever we're calling the object of this class and the number of ingredients should be passed so let's test this out so in our main function let's def define um, create an object of the rest of the recipe class so we'll just say recipe pizza is equals to new recipe and it holds nine ingredients this is how we pass it here now that we have that we want to say pizza dot cook so when we call pizza dot cook it should print for us and pass in the number of ingredients that we've passed in our new object and then let's just run this and see good cooking with nine ingredients so if i set this to five it will print out cooking with five ingredients so with this class defined we, we and we have created our object let's look at something else called an interface so an interface is a class that specifies a set of methods without providing the implementation details that a class implementing it must provide so an example of that would be we could create a, a simple interface like uh, giving it the keyword abstract so it's a type of class so we still call use the keyword class and we want to give it the name shape and inside here we just want to set in a method in this interface called double area so we know that we have that interface we can create a simple class this class will call it circle and then we're going to to be able to call or use a specific interface you use the keyword implements and we'll call our interface so that we can be able to use this specific um, function that has been provided so we'll just define a variable of type double and name it radius and then we're just going to define the constructor this dot radius and then now we're going to use this function double area so it will be overridden of course double area and inside here now we implement our own logic inside this function so we can say return 
3.14 times radius times radius. Since we need to return a double, that's why it had an error. We need to return a double. So there we have it. So what an interface does, it's a nice way of actually constructing, creating a very constructive and clean and clean code within your project. You can create, a, have an interface, define what the structure of how your class should look like, what type of functions it should have, the name and all that. So then what you do when you're creating your class is you use the same either the function name or variables it's a cleaner way of doing it rather than coming here and uh, calling a specific uh, function name any name that i can think of i can use this interface as a blueprint of whenever um if one one of the things that i may need in my class will be a function that does this and this so let's call it area that means this function will be used within a class but now we do not control the logic whatever logic that's put in the class is what's going to be used but it has to return a specific data type i hope that makes sense <laughs> so I, what i mean is another example this is the area of a circle right let me give a perfect example of what i mean so i may have another class called rectangle we'll implement the same interface We'll implement the same interface and inside here we'll have when getting the area of a rectangle it's width times height right so we'll have height and we'll have width and then let's just define the constructor so width and this is height so since we have implemented this interface it will bring for us in a normal like in we're using an ide itself we'll be able to override this function double area but now you'll notice when getting the of course when getting the area of a rectangle the code the logic that we put inside is definitely different from getting the area of a circle right so we'll return with times height as you can see so you find that we're using the same structure in terms of we want our function name to look like this using the help of an interface so it will always be area area that's the name we're going to use it's a cleaner way of doing it but the logic inside the interface has no control over it we're able to implement our logic as it seems fit but it has to return a type of double I hope it makes sense so it's a cleaner way of doing it great and it also allows us to perform code reusability and ensuring that classes are adhering to a certain rule you can create your own rules within your application how rules should be handled like when we're calculating the area we use the function name area and should turn return a data type of doubles for example so another thing that uh that's a uh, that we talk about in object oriented is inheritance this is a mechanism that allows you to create a new class like a subclass by inheriting properties and behaviors from an existing class which will be like a super class so we use a concept this concept follows the is a relationship so a subclass is a specialized version of a super class or maybe the way we call it like um, a parent and a child so let's try and give an example uh, we'll come over here and create another class and this class will give it an the name animal and we'll have variable name then age and then let's just define the constructor quickly this dot age then we'll have a simple function that says eat and it will print out the name of the animal is eating something like that 
then uh, we can derive or create a derived or a so this is more or less like the super class that we're talking about so we can create us we can create a subclass or a derived class because it will be derived from the animal class so we can say class dog extends we use the keyword extends animal so we'll have the string breed variable called breed and then when you define a construct in a subclass you typically call the constructor of the super class using super to initialize the inherited properties so how we'll do that is we just call create our constructor as we should and then we're going to define the name the age as you can see here and then we pass in our own variable and we need to use a super so that it can pick from the constructor in the super class so if we decide to create a variable a function sorry called back we can come here and say print name if you realize we do not have um we do not have a variable called name in dog we are able to access it because we have extended the variables and the functions from the super class which is animal so we'll say name is barking and there we have it so you'll find dog is a sub subclass of animal which means it will inherit the name the age and even the eat the function uh, eat from animal I hope that makes sense and now it has its own additional variables which is breed and also an additional function which is back so what this helps also is that you don't have to repeat the same variables within different classes you can have one class that has like the skeleton of it so an animal generally has a name and an age then we'll have like you can create now another class like dog now that's which is more specific where you extend the main uh, features of an animal and then add the, this unique uh, variable that holds a feature specifically for a dog so that basically that's how it would work so another thing that we can look at that we'll get to see in you get seen uh, in that and also in flutter is mixing so we can be able to create a class um, of type uh, mixing let me show you how so to be able to create a mixing class you need to use a keyword mixing and we can just use something like um, logging mixing and then we just define a function called log that expects a parameter message and then print this message wait so now that we have this what will happen is we can use this mixing in a specific class let's define a class of our own so we'll call that class let's just call it my class and to be able to use the mixing we use the keyword with then we call the logging mixing and then now inside it we just say we can define our own sorry wow um let's just copy this so we can define our own function do something and inside it we just call log we just say log doing something so this log we don't have it within this class we've just picked it from this um for the mixing class so this made the beauty of mixing class is that you can create several functions that you may reuse within your uh, application define them inside there then for you to be able to use them in your different classes all you have to do is pass the keyword with and now just call the function instead of repeating instead of 
create recreating another func a function like this one again over here it's already defined once in a class in a mixing class all you have to do is just call it instead of defining it i hope that makes sense so now that we have walked through the I hopefully the basics of that I think now we can proceed to the next lesson where now we get into the matter of things which is all things dot frog <laughs>